Okay, let's make this start. So, good morning, bonjour, and talo falava, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to this webinar entitled uh, Coral Reefs in the South Pacific Outlook from the Global Reef Expedition. My name is Nicolas Roque, and I'm a coastal and marine specialist here at SPREP, based in Samoa. Uh, I would like to welcome and thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, SPREP is organizing jointly with the Khaled Bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation. I will let Rone Carlton introduce ourselves, as well as the Living Oceans Foundation uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and I just would like to share some quick opening remarks. Um, so please note our webinar today is recorded and will be available on the SPREP YouTube channel uh, further to the event. Uh, English and French interpretation is also available for our French speaking partners, and you can access the interpretation button at the bottom uh, right of your screen. So please make sure to choose one of the two channels, uh, English or French. Um, please also keep your camera and micro off during the presentation. Uh, you can use the chat box to ask questions and seek clarification during the presentation and a Q&A session uh, is scheduled after the presentation. So the main objective of this webinar is to share and discuss uh, the results and findings of the global reef expedition uh, for the Pacific region. Over the course of 10 years, the Living Ocean Foundation completed this large coral reef study around the world. Together with scientists and communities from different regions and countries, they conducted extensive coral benthic and fish surveys. We will hear about this voyage, uh, of which the results represent a great contribution to our knowledge and understanding of coral reefs, both worldwide and in the Pacific region. Uh, around 25, 27% of the world's corals are located within the Pacific region, spread out over vast areas. They are fundamental ecosystems providing a wide range of ecosystem services and play a crucial role in the development and well being of Pacific Island countries and territories. However, many threats and pressures threaten their existence or their ability to evolve and adapt. And we know we must act now to limit these pressures. The IPCC special report on the ocean, for example, states that nearly all warm water coral reefs will experience significant area loss and local extinctions, even if global warming is contained to 1.5 degree. This 1.5 degree target is therefore crucial to achieve and Pacific Island states are strongly advocating for this um, in the lead up of the climate COP27 especially. And be it for a global response on climate change mitigation, or for national and local coral conservation measures, scientific knowledge is critical to ensure evidence-based policy, as well as our traditional knowledge and custodianships developed for centuries on reefs and coastal areas in the Pacific. However, the remoteness of reefs and other challenges for Pacific Island states can make it difficult to gather scientific information. In this sense, the Global Reef Expedition greatly contributes to the scientific effort and understanding of coral reefs in the region, as well as to building capacities in terms of monitoring, ocean and reef literacy. All of this under the overarching principle of science without borders, I, I, as we will uh, listen. We are also delighted to co-host this webinar and learn more about these findings as they contribute to the knowledge base and capacity building component of the Pacific Coral Reef Action Plan. The plan has been endorsed by SPREP member countries and territories in September last year. In addition to the various coral reef conservation projects that Pacific Island countries and territories are implementing, the plan aims to facilitate collaboration, exchange and partnerships at the regional level to help secure the future of the Pacific reefs and the livelihoods of its people. So this is basically a platform for cooperation and SPREP is committed to implementing this plan with all members and partners, agencies and non-state actors to sustain the health and resilience of the Pacific coral and the communities who rely on them. 
You will find more information uh, on the link I will put in the chat box later, including a short video introducing the Pacific Coral Reef Action Plan that has been released recently. As part of the Pacific Coral Reef Action Plan, and to further develop its knowledge and scientific capacities for Pacific Coral Reefs, SPREP has now an endorsed action under the UN Decade of Ocean Science, entitled Pacific Coral Reef Action Science. Now, this webinar is one of the first events as part of this UN Decade action, and we look forward to implementing this action and fostering the actionable knowledge needed for resilient corals in the Pacific and beyond. So uh, thank you again for your participation today. I'm now giving the floor to Rene Carlton so she can introduce herself uh, and give the main presentation. So please, please again put your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to capture most of them for our discussion later. Thank you, Rene, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Okay, so good morning or evening. Um, thank you to SPREP and Nicola and Peter Davies for hosting this webinar. My name is Renee Carlton, and I'm gonna be speaking to you about the work of the Collide Ben Sultan Living Oceans Foundation and our work on the Global Reef Expedition, which was the world's largest coral reef mapping and surveying effort. I think first, it's important to introduce the foundation and our work before we dive into the findings from the Global Reef Expedition. So who are we? We're a US-based nonprofit organization that focuses on using a three-pronged approach, combining science, education, and outreach. And we use science-based solutions to protect and restore ocean health. I'm actually gonna share a film clip next that was recorded at the beginning of the expedition which um, explains a bit about the foundation and let our founder, Prince Khaled, explain why he felt it was important to support the Global Reef Expedition. The Khaled bin Sultan oops, oops, Living Oceans Foundation surveys ah. <laughs> coral reefs around the world and helps governments develop conservation strategies. But many of these sanctuaries are dying, shadows of their former selves. Scientists estimate that 20% of the world's coral reefs are already lost. Another 35% are in grave danger. Just over a decade ago, His Royal Highness Prince Khalid bin Sultan established the Living Oceans Foundation to try to bring people from around the world together to work in harmony to combat this coral reef crisis that we're seeing unfold in front of us. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert, but I thought that, you know, the only way to help is to provide the tools for the scientists. The foundation brings a wealth of resources to study coral reefs. The Golden Shadow is on a voyage around the globe focusing on the crisis facing coral reefs. On this six-year special expedition, the ship will travel through the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, as well as the Red Sea. So by expanding research and conservation, we can help the coral reefs return. Okay, so as you heard, the Global Reef Expedition was undertaken to understand the implications of um, the coral reef crisis and to capture a snapshot of the status of the world's reefs. 
The Global Reef Expedition, or GRE, was actually a 10-year research mission. It turned into a 10-year research mission where we circumnavigated the globe and we surveyed coral reefs to better, better understand the magnitude of the crisis. The expedition also embodied the philosophy of science without borders, which is a philosophy that the foundation tries to exemplify in all of our projects. In each country where we were invited to work, we brought an international team of scientists together with local leaders, conservationists, government officials, and subject matter experts to assess the state of the reefs. These local representatives provided us with invaluable knowledge and helped us share findings with local communities. And this philosophy really allowed us to leverage the resources, commitment, and ideas necessary to make substantial progress to protect and preserve coral reefs. With over 53,000 kilometers traveled, the Global Reef Expedition collected an astonishing amount of data, including an impressive 65,000 square kilometers of coral reef habitat maps, close to 17,000 benthic and fish surveys, 9,000 mapping validation transects, and we spent a total of 151 days scuba diving, which is the equivalent of spending a year and a half underwater. The GRE brought us to 16 countries from the Saudi Arabian coastline through the Caribbean, South Pacific, and ending in the Indian Ocean. We were able to survey over 1,200 sites, and most of the locations we surveyed were remote, many having little to no human disturbance. As I stated before, it was important that we used a three-pronged approach to combine science, science, education, and outreach on the GRE. In addition to the scientists on board the ship, it was important important that we brought along educators and either a film crew or professional photographers to help us visualize and share what we were seeing underwater, not only with the local communities, but with audiences worldwide. On the Global Reef Expedition, we held many community outreach events. These offered us the opportunity to share our knowledge of coral reefs, um, learn how communities were using the reefs, and to speak with local and traditional leaders about our research. From these meetings, we were able to then cater our research to benefit the host communities. In, the, in these meetings, government officials and community members share their knowledge about the use of reef resources and the issues that they observed and discuss um, possible solutions to these problems. We learned about things like deadly crown of thorn starfish outbreaks, destructive fishing practices, um, important target species and changes to the reef over time. We also hosted tours of our research vessel, the My Golden Shadow, uh, to share more intimate details and information with the communities and governments about the research that we were conducting. As part of the Science Without Borders philosophy, we hosted and, culture. And nous aider dans notre recherche. Et en tant que philosophie, donc, qui nous anime, la science sans frontières, nous avons pu donc à rassembler plusieurs conseillers scientifiques, à obtenir des liaisons culturelles. Et au total, plus de 7000 personnes ont pu assister à nos séminaires sur les récifs, nos événements communautaires et aussi participer à ces tournées donc, sur notre navire. Pour ce qui est de la portion d'éducation de l'expédition, nous avons organisé au début des centaines de séminaires d'éducation dans l'ensemble de la zone de Washington, D.C. pour les élèves primaires et début du secondaire, leur enseigner des données sur les récifs coralliens, partager les travaux que nous, après avoir établi la structure du séminaire, nous avons étendu nos programmes d'éducation pour des parties prenantes dans différents pays. Notre programme d'éducation a été accueilli en Jamaïque. Nous avons organisé une une, un atelier de planification de conservation pour euh, l'attention des élèves de lycée, ainsi que partager euh, les données avec les, de Pedrobank avec les, les pêcheurs. Nous avons dans l'archipel Tomago, nous avons amené euh, différents élèves du primaire à bord du navire pour leur enseigner les, les coraux et la recherche qui était effectuée. La province de Lao, Fidji, était la première fois que la fondation a passé un, beaucoup de temps et de ressources pour des programmes d'éducation euh, sur terre afin de en, conformément, de, en conjonction avec nos recherches scientifiques, nous avons pu mener différents séminaires, 14 séminaires dans les écoles et 8 euh, euh, séminaires d'éducation sur les coraux dans les villages. Nous avons également fourni des séminaires supplémentaires dans la capitale de Souva pour euh, les étudiants de l'Université du Pacifique Sud, les membres du ministère des Pêches, ainsi que différentes parties prenantes à l'UICN qui s'occupe de, de récifs coralliens. Nous avons atteint 
près de 1500 personnes sur 10 îles dans la province de Laos. Euh, pour renforcer nos succès au Fiji, nous avons pu amener nos épreuves d'éducation à 19 îles différentes dans le, le royaume de, de, des Tonga, euh, dans les différents groupes d'îles Apaï, Avao et Niutupatu. Notre, nos séminaires d'éducation sur les récifs coralliens ont atteint 2300 personnes, y compris 15 écoles, 17 communautés, une, 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 une réunion à l'intention des, des gouvernements et trois séminaires à bord. Nous lance, dans le dernier emplacement, nous avons également pu mener des travaux d'éducation dans les îles Salomon, différentes communautés où les hommes, les femmes et les enfants de tous les âges ont été invités à participer. Nous avons organisé quatre séminaires dans les écoles et 25 séminaires dans la communauté et accueilli quatre visites du navire. Nous avons atteint près de 2900 personnes dans les îles Salomon. Outre nos travaux euh, sur le terrain, nous avons également développé de nombreux programmes d'éducation que nous sommes encore en train d'utiliser aujourd'hui. Il s'agit du programme CREW, c'est-à-dire éducateur des récifs coralliens sur l'eau, euh, le programme sur les mangroves d'éducation sur les mangroves et sur leur restauration, sur l'écologie des récifs coralliens et des sciences sans frontières. Je vais vous partager les informations sur certains de ces, de ces événements plus tard lorsque je vais parler de nos projets actuels et à venir. En outre de nos programmes éducatifs, nous avons aussi pu euh, donc promouvoir donc, le, les connaissances sur les océans à travers des films et des documentaires. Depuis le début de notre expédition en 2011, nous avons produit une centaine de films venant de courts métrages jusqu'à de longs métrages pour les partager avec le public. Ces films ont été donc montrés au travers des festivals au travers du monde, à la télévision et ont été incorporés dans nos matériels d'éducation. Jusqu'à présent, nous avons produit cinq longs métrages et deux séries TV qui ont été montrés sur PBS, Curiosity Stream et sur la chaîne Smithsonian, ainsi que d'autres euh, chaînes de TV dans le monde entier. Vous pouvez regarder nos dernières, nos dernières séries, Nos océans vivants, sur EarthX TV. Ces films représentaient un investissement significatif de temps et de ressources, y compris le fait d'allouer de l'espace précieux à bord du navire pour l'équipe de tournage. Mais pour nous, il s'agissait d'un investissement qu'il était valable de faire. Jusqu'à présent, nos films ont reçu plus de 50 prix, ont été visionnés par des millions de personnes sur la télévision et en ligne. Comme je l'ai dit, pour chacune de nos missions de recherche, nous avions des équipages donc, pour filmer nos activités ou des photographes professionnels à bord de notre expédition. D'ailleurs, cela se faisait avec le partenaire de ILCP, une organisation but non lucratif qui rassemble les meilleurs photographes du monde pour avancer les efforts d'écologie à travers le monde. En plus, beaucoup de plongeurs scientifiques se sont donc amenés à nous aider. Parce que le rayonnement était une composante critique de notre expédition, l'équipe de communication a affiché des messages sur les réseaux sociaux. À chaque jour que nous étions en mer, ce contenu a été écrit à l'intention d'un auditoire général, mais a également été utile et efficace pour fournir plus de transparence sur la mission de recherche à l'intention des, des membres de la communauté qui étaient curieux sur ce que nous faisions. Les blogs à eux seuls ont atteint plus de 800 000 personnes dans chaque, pratiquement chaque pays au monde. Alors, passons maintenant au volet scientifique de notre recherche scientifique, donc menée au cours de notre expédition. Nous avons rassemblé une équipe de plus de 200 scientifiques experts pour relever donc l'état de nos récifs dans 16 pays entre les années 2006 et 2015. Nous avons pu constater que nous avons eu des changements et des évolutions très importantes sur ces récifs. Néanmoins, moins, notre donnée est tellement exhaustive, sont tellement exhaustives que nous avons une source très fiable d'informations sur ces systèmes donc, de récifs. Nos objectifs ont été d'avoir donc une cartographie et une bonne caractérisation des écosystèmes de nos récifs, d'identifier le statut actuel et les menaces, donc, qui pèsent sur nos récifs et examiner les facteurs qui pourraient amener une meilleure résilience et survie de nos récifs. Nous, nous avons développé des méthodes standardisées basées sur des euh, protocoles utilisés euh, très largement. Nous avons basé nos méthodes sur euh, les le protocole d'évaluation de l'Atlantique euh, du Golfe qui a été utilisé pour euh, évaluer les récifs coralliens dans les Caraïbes pendant plus de 20 ans. Les informations enregistrées comprennent toujours des paramètres euh, euh, important pour, euh, comme par exemple, euh, la couverture en, en coraux, en algues, en invertébrés, en, euh, les poissons, les tailles de poissons et le nombre de poissons. Nous pouvons utiliser ces euh, informations pour 
évaluer la santé globale de l'écosystème. Lorsque nous avons des études, nous avions une équipe de cartographie qui relevait des informations importantes pour développer les, les cartes bathymétriques à haute résolution les plus précises possibles. Les méthodes ont été améliorées. Avec donc l'apport de, de notre imagerie satellitaire utilisant donc le système QuickBird et Worldview 2.3 en combinaison avec toutes les données obtenues à partir de nos relevés aériens et des vérifications de terrain menées par nos scientifiques et chercheurs de la Fondation, nous avons pu créer des cartographies bathymétriques de haute résolution et des cartes de habitat thématiques donc pour les environnements de moindre profondeur dans 10 pays, euh, c'était les cartographies les plus précises dans le monde. Ces cartes euh, passent de, du littoral, environ 25 mètres de profondeur. Euh, vérification de terrain qui a été menée, donc, peut être utilisée pour définir les classes, les classifications d'habitants euh, et aussi euh, donc les sondages de profondeur, le déploiement de caméras pour mesurer donc les activités, les substrat de sédiments et aussi des, bah, des évaluations en fonction de plongée et des euh, relevés de transectes par photo. Ceci a mené à une publication par Purkis et Al que je peux mettre à votre disposition. Nous avons aussi publié deux atlas et toutes nos, toutes nos cartes donc euh, sur les Bahamas et notamment peuvent être donc accessibles en ligne et ceci vous est disponible donc sur notre site web et je me ferait un plaisir de pouvoir vous les faire parvenir. Pour mesurer la communauté bantique, des transectes de 10 mètres ont été menés à des profondeurs de 4, 5, 10, 15 et 25 mètres. Nous avons enregistré ce qui se trouvait sur les fonds marins, des intervalles de 10 cm sur le transect de 10 mètres. Nous, les, les données métriques que nous avons enregistrées comprennent le type de substrat, le genre de coraux, le fond, groupe fonctionnel d'algues et le genre d'invétérés lorsque possible. Nous avons également mené des transectes de photos aux mêmes profondeurs utilisant un quadrillage 1 mètre par 1 mètre sur un transect de 10 mètres. Nous avons pu amener ces données dans, dans le laboratoire et mener une analyse de coraux euh, point de, de, de compte de coraux, nous avons pour mieux capturer l'ensemble de l'écosystème, nous avons mené des transects dans différents habitats des récifs coralliens, y compris le front récifal et les sites de lagunes lorsque c'était possible. Alors, les transects de population de poissons ont été complétés sur les mêmes sites et aux mêmes profondeurs. En fonction donc de distance de 30 mètres, donc ont été complétés. Là, nous avons pu relever des, les espèces de poissons telles que nous avons pu les observer, leur nombre, la dimension, le biomasse, la densité et le classement aussi de leur euh, dimension. Je sais qu'il s'agit de beaucoup d'informations. Je vais vous donner plus de détails sur ce que nous avons trouvé dans quelques instants, mais je voulais simplement souligner certains des résultats provenant de nos recherches. Ce graphique vous montre en haut, vous avez le pourcentage de couverture de macroalgues, ensuite les coraux au milieu et en bas, la biomasse de poissons. Les données correspondent à différentes îles ou atolls qui ont été euh, étudiées et la couleur est basée sur le pays qui se trouve en haut. Euh, ce ce cadre vous montre les îles que nous avons étudiées dans le Pacifique Sud. Je vais peut-être rentrer un petit peu plus dans les données. Dans l'ensemble, je dirais que dans le Pacifique, la plus, là où nous avons trouvé les biomasses les plus importantes, dans l'archipel des Tomato en Polynésie française, que certains récifs du, de la partie nord de la Grande Barrière de Corail. Le, c'est un, un système hautement protégé. Nous, avons, nous faisons un relevé dans la partie la nord. Ce, dans, ce qui est un parc marin, une zone protégée, ce qui, comprend, donc ce, ce qui implique une pression de pêche moindre. Et c'est pour ce quoi nous pensons que nous avons une biomasse plus importante. L'archipel de Tiongto en, en Polynésie française nous a nous surpris un petit peu parce que nous ne pensions pas qu'il y aurait une biomasse aussi élevée. Et ça dépend. Euh, quand, euh, si nous avons eu des perturbations récentes, dans, dans l'ensemble, l'archipel des Gambiers en Polynésie française avait la, la moyenne la plus élevée de couverture de coraux, suivie par les Palaos et les îles Salomon. Les îles Salomon et les Palaos étaient deux emplacements qui se trouvaient à proximité du triangle de coraux et qui avaient seulement vécu des perturbations assez minimes au cours des assez récents. C'est pour, ce, pour cela que nous avons des bons résultats dans ces zones. La couverture de macro était habituellement basse dans la plupart des emplacements du Pacifique et les algues coralliennes encroutantes étaient l'algue observée le plus souvent dans cette région. 
Alors maintenant, venons-en d'une manière plus précise en ce qui concerne les communautés bénéfiques de l'océan Pacifique. Alors, dans l'ensemble, la couverture corallienne moyenne du Pacifique était de 36 en raison de la distance entre les archipels de la Polynésie française. Nous avons décidé d'analyser les données séparément plutôt que de les regrouper. Comme je l'ai dit, l'archipel des Gambiers était vraiment celui qui avait la couverture de coraux la plus élevée bien que les Palaos avaient une couverture de 5, donc assez proche, c'est-à-dire que pour Gambier, nous avons 52% de Palaos et, et Palaos, 49% de coraux vivent. Alors, cette couverture élevée de corail donc, à Palaos ne nous a pas vraiment surpris puisque nous savons que les, de bonnes mesures ont été prises pour protéger leur système de récifs et que nous n'avons pas eu de grandes perturbations avant que nous fassions notre relevé. Euh, donc, récifs n'ont pas fait l'expérience de dégâts à cause de cyclones et d'autres dégâts. Non. Parce que nous étions surpris par la couverture de coraux dans l'archipel des Gambiers, nous voulions voir s'il y avait des tendances qui pourraient indiquer pourquoi cette zone avait une couverture aussi élevée de coraux. Lorsque nous avons étudié les atolls qui ont été étudiés à Gambier, il n'y avait pas d'autres qui étaient du même ordre, mais ils avaient tous une couverture de coraux de plus de 50 Lorsque nous évaluons les genres de coraux présents dans les atolls, les genres de coraux, les lacropora, les pasilopora et les porites. Et dans l'ensemble, ceci n'était pas surprenant car cet emplacement est assez éloigné du triangle de coraux. Nous avons euh, lancé l'hypothèse que c'est parce que les emplacements que nous avons étudiés dans cet archipel sont éloignés et ils, ont donc, ils connaissent donc des perturbations minimes de la part des êtres humains. Et peut-être parce qu'il n'y avait pas eu de, de perturbations récentes, cette zone était florissante et peut-être plus résiliente comparée à d'autres régions. Avec la nouvelle découverte de de récifs d'eau profonde vierge de près, proche de Tahiti. Nous sommes très enthousiastes pour voir quelles sont les nouvelles recherches qui vont venir de cette zone pour pouvoir réévaluer les, les récifs dans cette zone. Les récifs avec la plus faible couverture en moyenne ont été trouvés donc dans la Polynésie française, dans le de, de, de la société et des Galpassos, à teneur de 21 seulement. Nous avons pu trouver que cette faible couverture dans les îles de la société était attribuable à une éruption de Acantaster, donc, qui donc était survenue juste avant nos efforts de relever. Les Galapagos sont un système non traditionnel de récifs qui donc ne nous a pas grandement surpris. Avant d'aller plus loin, je voudrais mentionner un autre emplacement qui nous a intrigué, la baie de Prony en Nouvelle-Calédonie. La plupart des emplacements que nous avons étudiés en Nouvelle-Calédonie faisaient partie de, des atolls entre Casto un groupe d'atolls qui se situe au nord du lagon principal de la Grande Terre. Ces atolls sont éloignés, ne sont pas habités, sont bien protégés et sont d'ailleurs un site du patrimoine mondial de l'UNESCO. La baie de Prony, par contre, se situe dans, euh, les, au point le plus au sud du lagon et proche de la terre principale. Il est également euh, entouré d'argile rouge, riche en métaux, avec un ruissellement d'érosion naturelle et puis des mines de nickel qui peuvent avoir un impact sur la baie et nous avons constaté cela. Nous avons également des cheminées hydrothermales à la baie de Prony avec des cheminées qui sont de plus de 30 mètres de haut, certaines, dont certaines atteignent presque la surface. Cet environnement semble avoir permis à des communautés de récifs coralliens uniques de s'adapter à ces conditions inhabituelles, avoir des genres de coraux que l'on ne retrouve pas dans d'autres zones de la nouvelle calédonie Lorsque l'on compare la couverture en coraux des atolls que nous avons étudiés au nouvelle calédonie la baie de Prony avait la couverture de coraux la plus élevée la communauté de coraux de, Prony, de la baie de Prony, qui ressemble à d'autres sites en nouvelle calédonie dominés par Acropora, qui représentait 39 des coraux. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que cette baie avait euh, des pourcentages beaucoup plus élé élevés de turbinaria, de leptoceris et de pachyceris, ce que l'on a pu constater à d'autres sites, ce qui pourrait indiquer que les, ces genres de coraux ont pu s'adapter à cet habitat improbable créant une communauté de coraux euh, unique. Mais nous ne sommes pas vraiment sûrs et je sais qu'il y a beaucoup de recherches qui sont effectuées pour en savoir plus. 
Alors, lorsque nous examinons de plus près donc, la diversité de corail à travers le Pacifique et l'océan Pacifique et l'océan Indien, nous avons trouvé que nous avons 74 espèces, donc une grande diversité, euh, donc, dans ces deux bassins donc, océaniques. Cette grande diversité si riche, donc, divalée en se diminuant à partir de l'éloignement du le triangle de corail. Les îles de Capagos, l'emplacement qui était le plus lointain à partir du triangle de corail, n'avait que quatre espèces et une moyenne de 2,2. Alors que pour le Tonga, les Palao, eh bien, ils ont montré la, 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 la diversité la plus élevée, allant de 8,5 à 8,7, donc des diversités par corail, par euh, transec de 10 mètres. Donc de, le pourcentage de moyen d'algues total dans les, Indiens, les océans pacifiques et indiens de 48 et surtout des algues coralliennes croutantes et des algues rouges et vertes. La Coupe nouvelle de calédonie et les îles Cook avaient le, le, le pourcentage le plus élevé enregistré des algues d'environ 60 et Kutuki, un atoll dans les îles Cook, était très impacté par les acatanstères avant que nos études n'aient lieu, avait donc une couverture de coraux beaucoup plus basse avec beaucoup de colonies mortes. Les algues avaient commencé à coloniser ces coraux euh, morts, ce qui, ce qui débouchait sur une couverture plus importante d'algues. Mais nous avons constaté qu'il est trouvé intéressant que bien que l'archipel de la société, les récifs des Galapagos, avaient la couverture de coraux la plus basse, ils n'avaient pas les, de, de, un grand pourcentage d'algues. Ils avaient plutôt un, un substrat dénudé. Au Galapagos, le sable était, et dans les, les îles de, de la société, ce, ce substrat dénudé était euh, dû à euh, une, 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 l'extension des lacs antastères. Sont maintenant pas de à ce que nous vent. avons pu constater en ce qui concerne les populations de poissons. Alors, une façon dont nous avons caractérisé et évalué les populations de poissons était de grouper les poissons par niveau trophique. Ceci nous permet de mieux comprendre ce qui se passe au niveau communautaire. Généralement, plus le poisson est petit, plus le niveau trophique est bas. Mais ceci n'est pas toujours vrai et beaucoup des, importantes, des espèces importantes de poissons au niveau économique se trouvent dans les, les niveaux trophiques les plus élevés. Ce n'est pas toujours le cas non plus. Le graphique en haut vous montre la densité de poissons pour chaque poisson qui est groupée par niveau trophique et en bas, vous avez la biomasse moyenne de poissons. Les données combinées pour les océans euh, Pacifique et Indien avaient une densité moyenne de poissons de 194 poissons par 100 mètres carrés et une biomasse de poissons de 20, 22 kg pour 100 mètres carrés. La densité la plus élevée de poissons et la deuxième biomasse était se trouvée dans l'archipel des Tomuatu en Polynésie française. Les récifs de l'archipel des Tomuatu avaient le plus de poissons des groupes trophiques 2,5, 2,9 et 3, 3, 4. Et deuxième niveau le plus élevé au niveau trophique 4, 85, qui comprend les grands prédateurs comme le barracuda, les mérous et les requins. Diving deeper into this archipelago, we found that sites around the atoll Pakarava, as seen on the right, um, had high fish biomass. This atoll hosted large schools of fish, um, ranging in both size and trophic level, and we saw schools of humpback snappers reaching numbers up to 1,500 fish in a school, various and numerous schools of chromis with numbers reaching into the hundreds, and free, uh, frequently recorded sharks, such as black tip reef sharks and gray reef sharks. While the Tuamotu archipelago had the highest fish density of all the locations surveyed, we were surprised by the fish density in Fiji. Going back to the original graphs, you can see that the Lao province in Fiji, um, which ha has the arrow, has the third highest mean fish density, rivaling the more well-protected areas such as the Chagos Archipelago and Northern Great Barrier Reef, but had a rather unremarkable mean fish biomass. Looking more specifically at the atoll surveyed in the Lao province, we found that, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try not to um, mispronounce this, Titia and Bulaga had the mean fish density that rivaled um, values that we saw in the Tuamotu Archipelago. Interestingly, this region also had Um, a higher species richness when compared to other locations in the South Pacific and Indian Ocean. There was also a relatively even spread of species observed from fish of the lower trophic levels 
um, 2.0 to 3.4, which were generally smaller in size and not targeted by sustenance fishers in this area. Given all this information, it's a little bit unclear what's driving the higher number of fish species we observed in the La province, and we're hoping to look into this further. Onga had alarmingly low fish density and fish biomass, um, the lowest of all of the locations surveyed in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Some studies suggest that, and I'll get into this a little bit later, um, baseline fish biomass on reefs should be uh, between 11 and 19 kilograms per 100 meters squared, and Tonga's fish biomass was substantially below that threshold. In this figure, we subset the economically important fish species to look at the size of the fish um, we recorded. And this graph really highlights that in most locations, there are few large economically more important fish remaining, suggesting that the reefs may be overfished. Um, the data corresponds well with the biomass that we saw in each country. The regions with the lowest fish biomass, such as Tonga, the Society and Austral Archipelago's French Polynesia, and the Cook Islands all had predominantly small fish remaining. So with all of that information, how are the Pacific reefs doing when compared to the Caribbean and Indian Ocean? We already did a little bit comparison of the Indian Ocean, so we'll get into that a little bit further. Coming back to the side slide, you can see that the Caribbean reefs as seen on the right um, had a much higher percentage of macroalgae than compared to the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Here's just for reference, here's the, um, the South Pacific sites. Um, Generally, it's difficult to compare the reefs of the Caribbean to the South or to the Pacific and Indian Oceans, as these reefs have substantially lower biodiversity in both their benthic and fish communities. They've also experienced substantial um, disturbances starting as early as the 1980s, where uh, there was a disease outbreak that severely reduced the diadema sea urchin population across the region. The reduction in diadema led to an overgrowth of macroalgae that reduced the overall live coral cover, and the reefs are still recovering from that disturbance today. They also experience higher fishing pressure than most of the locations that we surveyed on the GRE in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and managing overfishing is a task being um, addressed by all of the countries that we visited in the Caribbean. They have also um, more recently experienced severe coral disease outbreaks, as well as bleaching events and hurricanes that have all had a negative impact on the system. Conversely, we surveyed the Chagos Archipelago in the Indian Ocean, and that area is one of the oldest and strictest marine protected areas in the world, and the benthic and fish communities really showed that. We saw high coral cover, and oftentimes with some areas that had nearly 100% live coral and a thriving fish community. Looking at the global comparison of coral cover, you can see that the live cover of the Caribbean on the left was substantially lower than the Pacific. The highest coral cover for this region was seen in St. Kitts and Nevis, where we only saw 14% live coral. The Chagos Archipelago, on the other hand, had substantially higher live coral cover, and this site had a mean cover of 40%. This graph shows the total algae, um, algal cover, combining all of the algae groups, such as CCA, turf algae, macroalgae, um, erect coral and algae. And as expected, we saw higher algal cover in the Caribbean countries, as you can see on the right. Um, interestingly, though, we saw a pretty high percentage of algal cover in the Cook Islands and New Caledonia. But as I mentioned before, this was predominantly occupied by CCA and turf. I think including the assessment of algal cover, especially macroalgal cover in monitoring programs is important as it could be indicative of a phase shift on the reef. Um, an increase in macroalgal cover could be used as an indicator of a disturbance on the reef and a failing to identify to and address the disturbance could have lasting impacts as we've seen in the Caribbean. Many researchers in the Caribbean believe that the reefs in the region have experienced an irreversible phase shift from coral to macroalgal dominated reefs. Um, while others believe that the reefs can recover with compounding disturbances, it's gonna become increasingly difficult for that to happen. By prioritizing um, addressing acute disturbances such as nutrient runoff or overfishing, managers can help reduce the chance of macroalgae um, overgrowing the reef and preserving the reef system. This graph shows the fish biomass seen on all of our survey locations. 
reefs in the Pacific and Indian Ocean generally had higher fish biomass and density than what was seen in the Caribbean. Um, some studies by McClanahan et al. and McNeil et al. Um, estimate that reef fish biomass targets should be between 11 and 19 kilograms per 100 meters squared. And most countries had mean fish biomass at or below this threshold. So the red bar on the graph shows the estimated threshold level. And you can see that all of the, the Caribbean locations on the left fall below this. Tonga, um, as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, the second from the left had extremely low fish biomass, worse than many of the locations, the countries that we surveyed in the Caribbean. The Society Archipelago and Austral Archipelago of French Polynesia, as well as the Solomon Islands and Cook Islands, all ha also had means below this recommended threshold. Overall, it seems like overfishing is a global problem that needs to be addressed. Most of the locations with the highest fish biomass were either strictly protected or had little, little to no fishing pressure. And so we recommend that the communities whose, fishing, whose fish biomass falls within that threshold. So um, again, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in here, <laughs> um, that they really prioritize maintaining the reef fish populations, not only for a more sustainable reef fishery, but to reduce additional uh, pressures onto the reef as a whole. Um, as we saw previously, the fish recorded for the economically important species or families were small with most fish recorded being below 20 centimeters in length. So we recommend including fish size and catch quotas in future management plans to help replenish um, the fish populations. And I know I didn't get into all of this during this talk, <laughs> but these are some of the main takeaways from the uh, Global Reef Expedition. Number one, we need to swiftly address climate change. Um, climate change is currently the biggest threat to coral reefs, as Nicola mentioned before. Um, coral bleaching and ocean acidification are a direct, direct result of climate change, and regardless of the status of a reef, these two disturbances will have substantial impacts globally if climate change is not addressed. Number two, reef fish populations are being overexploited. Um, as I showed, nearly every country visited on the GRE showed signs of overfishing and have predominantly small fish remaining, particularly in families fished for subsistence and commercial fishing. Most reef fish populations are unable to withstand the fishing pressure they're currently experiencing, and expansion and enforcement of fishing regulations will be critical. Number three, we need better management of acute reef disturbances. Both natural and human-induced disturbances are having a negative impact on coral reefs. Widespread coral mortality from crown thorn starfish outbreaks was seen in Saudi Arabia, French Polynesia, Tonga, and the Solomon Islands, and we witnessed an active outbreak in um, the Cook Islands. Most of the natural acute disturbances, such as tsunamis, storms, and crown thorn starfish outbreaks are harder to manage, However, managing and relieving other reef stressors, such as nutrient runoff and overfishing, can help these reefs recover from these acute disturbances. Marine protected areas work um, in conserving coral reefs for number four. <laughs> um, we were able to work in some of the world's oldest and largest MPAs. And some countries we visited, such as Australia, Palau, and New Caledonia, have large human populations utilizing these reefs and have prioritized establishing large protected and managed areas to conserve their nearshore reef systems. And in nearly every instance, these reefs have the best coral um, and reef fish communities. So protecting remote reefs and using marine spatial planning to strategically place no take, no entry MPAs can really help engender the coral reef resilience. And number five, lastly, collaboration with local communities has the biggest impact on reef conservation. In order to protect and conserve the world's reefs, aggressive measures will need to be taken. Um, one of the biggest takeaways from the GRE was that in that nearly every community we worked with around the world expressed and continues to express the want and need for conservation of the reef systems. Working directly with communities, continuing education programs and sharing science and data um, and expanding on current management efforts has proven to be the most successful in conserving reefs visited on the jury. So now on to what resources we have and what we're using and what we're expanding on. 
from the science side, our research and research stemming from the invited scientists on the Global Reef Expedition has resulted in over 100 peer-reviewed publications, fields, um, and country reports, atlases, and monitoring protocols. There are individual country or final reports, especially from the South Pacific, that I encourage you to explore as they go into much more detail about the findings from each country, especially at the island level. I authored most, most of these, so I'm more than happy to discuss some of the findings from them if you would like more information, um, but I do encourage you to visit our website where they're all freely available for download. Um, it's just www.livingoceansfoundation.org. All of the data and coral reef maps are shared on our World Reef Map Portal, which is a global online interactive map that allows you to explore all of the reefs that we mapped, access underwater videos and photos of coral reef habitats and spatial analyst tools. Now we're sharing these high resolution habitat maps, uh, mapping products with NASA through a partnership that will help them map the rest of the world's reefs. With the completion of the GRE and the curation of this massive baseline data set, we've also been partnering with the University of Miami to model and map reef resilience and highlight areas or regions where corals are, could re rebound or potentially survive this coral reef crisis. We'll be sharing the results from this work with not only other scientists, but with managers and marine spatial planners as well. If you would like to be informed of new products from this project, please feel free to reach out to it any of us, um, me or any of my colleagues, and we'll, we're happy to be sure to share any new findings that come from this. To help increase ocean literacy and to spread awareness of the challenges reefs are facing, we've made all of our award-winning films freely available for viewing on our website and YouTube channel. These films range in topic from overfishing to marine spatial planning, and I encourage you to explore them when you have a chance or to share them with anyone within your community. Um, for the education side, one of them, like I said before, I would discuss some of the projects that we are currently um, we currently have in place and are continuing to grow. One of the successful education initiatives um, developed to help educate teachers and youth about mangrove ecosystems is called the Mangrove Education and Restoration Program. Many local partnerships with governments and nonprofit um, environmental organizations were shaped during the GRE, and as a result, the foundation partnered with these organizations to implement the mangrove education and restoration program in the Bahamas and Jamaica. This extensive two-year uh, mangrove program teaches students about the basic ecology of mangroves using a combination of lectures, um, reinforcement activities, uh, field experience, and two long-term scientific investigations. And over time, the students and teachers can see the positive changes that they're making to the forest and to their coastal community. So if you'd like to bring this into your community, um, if you have mangroves, we also are happy to expand into the Pacific as well. To address the lack of coral reef education around the world, the foundation developed an award-winning coral reef ecology curriculum. The curriculum is hosted on our education portal, making it easily accessible to anyone around the world who wants to learn about coral reefs. The curriculum was developed for use in K through 12 classrooms and is particularly useful for e-learning. There are currently 14 units available and include a variety of educational resources, such as videos, interactives, activities, and quizzes. Additionally, we offer two-day teacher professional development workshops to educate teachers about coral reefs and the use of the ed portal materials within their classrooms. Um, one of the most, I guess, exciting <laughs> uh, programs that came out of the, um, ed through education was, and our work on the jury was that we found that some of the youth, the youth were not as engaged in learning about science. So we were able, we were um, quite excited and eager to create a program that would inspire young students to learn about the ocean through a different learning path, such as art. So we created um, an annual international art contest called the Science Without Borders Challenge to inspire youth around the world to learn about various ocean conservation issues by creating artwork. Um, each year there's a new ocean conservation theme and the contest is open to, to all students from 11 to 19 years old. 
who are enrolled in primary school, secondary school, or the homeschool equivalent. Winners in each category receive a prize of up to $500, and the foundation uses the student's artwork to raise awareness and spark con uh, conversations about ocean conservation. We actually just released last week our um, the theme for this year titled The Sixth Extinction, where we're asking students to create a piece of artwork that highlights the beauty and, and importance of marine species that are on the brink of extinction. So we would really appreciate if you would share this year's contest with any of the schools or school-aged children that you may know. I'd lastly like to share a little bit of information about our um, action that was endorsed as part of the United Nations Ocean Decades Program. Because we strongly believe in using co-design to work within the communities and to help improve their conservation and ocean literacy, we leverage off of our existing Science Without Borders philosophy to help expand conservation in the tropics. So the Science Without Borders project will help communities leverage scientific data, resources, and technologies to conserve the tropical marine ecosystems. We'll be using not only our scientific data collected on the GRE, but also information that's a result of our ongoing partnerships with the University of Miami and the reef resilience model, model that we're helping to develop together, NASA and the reef maps that they're developing, as well as the Pacific Blue Foundation that um, based out of Fiji that has developed a tool to help streamline analysis of phototransects. This project will allow us to expand our education and outreach programs to be inclusive across genders and generations. So we're able to reach a wider audience, improving ocean literacy, not just of school children, um, but their parents or grandparents as well. This will hopefully inspire conservation um, and behavior change at a community level rather than exclusively working with government officials. Um, we're always open to new partnerships. And as this project was recently endorsed, I'd love to hear from any of you that might be interested in bringing this or any of our other programs to your community. We're also looking for funding opportunities and would be happy to go in on a grant together to help facilitate this work in the South Pacific more. So with that, I'd like to thank our founder, Principal Ed, for being so dedicated to supporting the work of the foundation and coral reef conservation. I'd also like to especially thank SPREP again for hosting this webinar. Um, I hope you've all found it useful. This work would not have been part possible without the many part, uh, past and present partners that we have. Um, having successful partnership has been a critical component of the success of the GRE, and we hope to continue working with these organizations as we take on our next chapter under the UN Ocean Decades Program. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Rene. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very instructive presentation. And there is a lot of information to digest <laughs> at first. Uh, but I'm sure uh, you will get many questions as we have also here some specialists of, from the countries and territories you surveyed, and many, uh, maybe some colleagues you, you have worked with. Uh, and I'm yeah. Now happy to open the Q and A session and just an open discussion with uh, with our colleagues and participants. So please feel free to raise your hand or turn your micro on to ask questions or and participate to the discussion. We now have uh, still around half an hour uh, if you if we want, and so we can yeah, grab the question from the chat box or directly uh, if you if you turn on your micro. Yeah, sure. Um, so one question in the chat box says, what's the best way to reach me for partnership? Um, you can email me. I'll put my email address in the chat box. It's carlton at Living Oceans Foundation or just lof.org. And that is a great way to reach me. And then I can put you in contact with our other, um, either our education outreach, other science team. So that's, I can get you in contact with anybody you may need. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, yes, Anne, please. 
Yeah, hi, Renee, and thanks so hi. much for your great presentation, really <laughs> insightful, so thanks so much for that. Uh, I was quite interested in your slide where you were showing a graph of uh, fisheries pressure and biomass uh, level, and I mm -hmm. saw that in the two MO2s where I am in French Polynesia at the moment, uh, the fisheries biomass is above that threshold, but mm -hmm. it's not the case for the society islands, so does that mean that it's overfished in the society islands here in French Polynesia? Because that's not what the government's saying. So I'd be quite interested I would, in hearing the scientific point of view on that. I mean, I would, I, there's, I think what's happening is there is inherently more fishing pressure within the society archipelago. Um, and so, yes, the data seems to show that, yes, that area is being overfished, especially when compared to um, the Tumoto archipelago. We did across just across all of the locations, we tried to survey the least um, uh, sort of the rem most remote areas. We didn't exclusively do that because sometimes you couldn't, um, but we really did try to focus on the areas that were least impacted by humans just so that we could really see what was going on with the reef system. And um, regardless, you know, you in most locations you couldn't they were experiencing some sort of fishing pressure. And I would say the Society Archipelago just population wise has a much higher population than the Tumoto Archipelago. So um, inherently fishing is gonna be more there. So based on the data, I would say, yes, they are being overfished. <laughs> okay, and we're talking about uh, inner lagoon fishes here or pelagic fishes or, that, um, or is it both? Reef, reef fish. So, so that <laughs> includes, so the fish was, it's basically from 25 meters and shallower. And then, so we weren't really including any of the um, offshore fishing, like tuna or anything like that. Um, we All right, okay. Okay, then. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a question. How does your benthic mapping work complement and or differ from that being done by the Allen Coral Atlas? Okay, so that is <laughs> a great question. Um, our maps are sort of serving two different purposes. Um, so we have, our maps are a much higher resolution than, and so we have much um, more habitat classifications than the Allen Coral Atlas. Also, um, the way that our maps are produced is using ground truthing, which not all of theirs have done. Although we did contribute for the South Pacific, we shared, um, our maps for French Polynesia, um, I know we shared with them and I can't remember where else, but we, um, I think it was the Indian Ocean maybe, but anyway, we shared some of our maps with them to help develop their um, and improve their mapping, but ours are definitely gonna be the most accurate as far as habitat classification goes. Um, we don't have quite the expanse that they do. The difference is that they've covered the world and we don't have that yet, but that's what where our project with, um, with the with NASA's kind of coming in is we're going to they're using our maps to sort of validate their um, their new methodology, which is um, it's complicated and hard to explain, but it's they're going to be creating a much more accurate world map reef map as well. So that should be coming. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes, it is blue buzzing. <laughs> Maybe I have one question, Rene. Um, yeah. Just want to know how all these data and results uh, you collected have uh, already been integrated, including and benefited to other you know, coral reef monitoring networks and databases, um, either at a global scale, like the GCRMN uh, report, uh, or at, at the national level or, or, or different level. Yeah. So. Um... We don't really, it's it's complicated. So we don't really, we don't share this data because we were, to, it, was, it took us so long to collect it and to like analyze it and condense it all together. So we're still sort of like on the publishing path right now. So that data will, you know, become available. We do share it um, with partners that reach out to us and we have, we establish MOUs with people. So we do share it, but it's more um, on a case by case basis. And, but we have shared all of our findings uh, 
through the country reports with each of the countries that we visited. So they all have access to it. And um, we have shared it with those findings with them. Um, and then we also have, you know, it's been used to create MPAs in a couple different locations in the Caribbean. And then also, um, you know, with in Fiji, they're working on one. So um, in the Lao province. And so our partners there have been using it. So we, it's more of like, like I said, it's more of a localized type thing. And we, but we don't really share it super globally just because we're still, <laughs> still publishing. As you can imagine, it takes forever. <laughs> it's a huge data set. All right. Thanks. But you, so you said uh, there were, there have been country reports for, for each of the, of the countries. Uh, yes. So they, okay. All right. Yeah, there, those are those are all on our website, and okay. um, they go into much finer detail. So they have yeah. to the island level, site level, um, much more detailed information. And again, if there's specific questions that you have of anything, please reach out to me because for the South South Pacific specifically, um, I wrote nearly all of them, all of them except for Fiji. So um, if you would like information on any of that, I'm happy to chat. Yeah, sure, sure. Because we we also uh, um, we also have some draft uh, fact sheets for each uh, Pacific country and territory uh, on coral reefs, on the states and uh, status of, of coral reefs. So uh, this is something we we, we would like to um, to finalize uh, by the end of the year, and uh, also taking into account the yeah the best available knowledge uh, on 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 the on the topic so yeah that would be yeah absolutely yeah check. and i mean uh, yeah i think on our side too what you know we're also interested in seeing you know looking maybe trying to do some further work too to see how much has changed because you know we really did like i said we did a snapshot of time of what the corals are looking like and it was you know a rapid assessment and it's it was an important time because it was before the 2015 global bleaching event that like really impacted so much of the, so many of the reefs. So we were able to get in before that, which was great. And so that's, you know, one of the benefits of our data set, but um, I do think it's, and so we're interested to see how much things have changed as well. So I definitely think there could be like a little trading of knowledge, <laughs> which would be beneficial. Because we could also incorporate that into our um, reef resilience model and things like that. So, and we are trying to incorporate as much as we can into that as well. Yeah, okay, great. And I know there was a lot of information in this talk. <laughs> So if you guys want to have, you know, if there's like a group that's interested in doing a more, you know, more specific, even um, we're happy to kind of try and do that as well. It's, there's just a lot happening and a lot of new people that don't really know that much about the global reef expedition that we completed. So. And you said, uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, yeah. Is it possible? Yeah. Jerry, yeah, Jerry Corey from Australia. Um, hi. Hi. Um, were you, how long did you stay at, at each site and were you able to address the, the uh, seasonal or interannual variability in the reef? Because you said sometimes you arrive just after. Uh, uh, crown zone uh, outbreak, or, or we all know also that they, you have uh, El Nino, La Nina events that would uh, strongly affect reefs. So were you able to address this kind of thing, or, or you think that uh, the, the snapshot you have is highly impacted by uh, this kind of events, intervariability, seasonality, and so on? I think in some, yes. Okay, so we were at each location for about a month. Um, so for for example, in French Polynesia, we were in each of those archipelagos, we spent a month in each of those archipelagos that we visited. Um, and then in each country, we spent about a, a minimum of three weeks there, but usually about a month. And um, as far as encompassing things like the um, crown and thorn starfish outbreaks, I mean, those are hard to 
predict. And so um, we didn't really have, a, we didn't really try to do that. We were mostly just trying to get as much data as rapidly as possible. So we didn't really take into account seasonality. We visited during winter, summer. I mean, it just kind of was like consecutive. So we, we were kind of like one month on, one month off, one month on, one month off. To, so that way we could get to the next, get the ship to the next location. Um, sometimes it was even more frequent than that. So it was really just like trying to get as much information as we could. There was one about one year that we had um, problems just because the ship had what broke down. <laughs> and so we were sort of stuck where we couldn't go out. But again, once that was up and running, it was like back to back to back, trying just to get, collect as much data as we could consecutively. Um, so that way we could just within a short period of time, look and see how the reefs are doing. So seasonality, not as much. We don't have temporal data as much either. Um, we didn't really go back to any sites. It was just like, hey, this is what it is at this point in time. Maybe in line with, with uh, uh, Thierry's question, um, because you said so some data and, and results have informed uh, some conservation measures like some MPAs, etc., um, and uh, um, some of these data and findings uh, did they have uh, also informed some coral restoration efforts and initiatives, and maybe in the Pacific. Uh, I mean, in terms of location, species, and uh, for that, uh, did you also get some information about the water quality, temperature, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so um, we didn't do as, so I guess coral restoration at the time wasn't really a big thing yet. You know, like when we collected all of that data, that wasn't really a thing, like coral restoration wasn't really a, um, a, a like project that a lot of countries had taken on or incorporated into their monitoring programs. So we didn't really incorporate that as much, but we do have information on um, coral to genera. So we can provide that information. Um, but, and we also, have we do have water temperature data associated with everything we had a team from university of miami and NOAA that was i was actually on that team at the time that was doing um ocean acidification research so we have water samples and ph samples um and things like that and some of that's already been published on we're working on other publications right now with that so we took um coral cores also um as far as climate change is go it goes, we were taking coral cores to look and see how ocean acidification was uh, impacting the coral growth and things like that. So we have some of that. Um, we also have um, other data like that we've collected from, or well, just condensed from prior satellite imagery um, in, or satellite data. So like chlorophyll levels, things like that associated with each site. So we have map layers um, with that information as well. Yeah, there's a lot, we have a lot of information, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, what, what, what we would like to try is to, um, yeah, to, to gather this information for the Pacific uh, and, and, you know, uh, every, every usable knowledge that we can gather uh, for uh, all the Pacific countries and territories uh, coming from mm -hmm. different surveys and, and yeah, so, yeah yeah that's okay yeah. yeah and i know going back to the question about like um the you know seasonality and and things like that and el nino and la nina years that it's so tricky and so it's so tricky to capture that when you're not doing repeat data and so that's something that we did encounter with some of our ocean acidification research um is that you know we know that within seasons are you know during summer versus winter, the corals are going to act differently than um, and respire, and so pH is going to change differently. So, even though that data is available, um, you know, we kind of caveat everything with the fact that it's it was a snapshot. It was just a quick. It was a rapid assessment of the of everything, but it is all it, it is available, um, and or should be available. That I'm not in charge of because I was collected by, like I said, by NOAA, but. It should be available to use. It's been published on, and I can get you in contact with the people that um, were in charge of that part. So, yeah. And then I think someone asked about 
did we learn how to deal with cots? And actually, because we encountered cots so many places, we did develop a, um, a cots monitoring and removal um, protocol, and that's available on our website. And we shared that with the Cook Islands specifically, since we did observe cots outbreak there in Aitutaki, and we went, we did share that with them, and we actually did go back to Aitutaki to reassess the reefs just to see if they'd recovered a couple of years later. Um, they still were experiencing COTS outbreaks and the COTS had moved from the pool reef into the lagoon. Um, and there wasn't, at the, just with that short amount of time, there hadn't been any recovery. But that's one of the only few locations that we were able to re-survey. Re All right, then so this, this protocol is, uh, uh, is kind of generic one, um, depending on, oh, yeah, we can, we can apply it. Uh, Every country and territory, uh, because it, this is a yeah, this can be a, a huge challenge uh, for some of the Pacific countries here. So, is it yeah, uh, generic enough to and um, to apply? Oh, the it? the cots the, removal. The, yes, I yeah. think so. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's. I think the main thing is that it's really important to um to really identify it first, and so you know when people see an increase in the COTS numbers, then that's when you need to like immediately act um, and remove the COTS physically. I mean, there's, I know that there's been new technology that has been developed that you can use, but if you are short on resources or, you know, both financially and just even ability to get out there, um, there are ways around it. And, um, you know, we have that, that can be applied to most locations throughout the South Pacific, because we do know that a lot of times it's like, oh, we don't have time to get the tools to, to do everything, but you can physically remove them safely. They are dangerous, <laughs> but safely remove them from the reef. And um, that's kind of the best way to handle it. But, but I can share that information with you as well. in the comments. Um, how much training did our reef surveyors have prior to this expedition and how did we prepare them for it? So actually um, all of our um, all of our surveyors were experts and so we had people we uh, most of them were either hired and um, either yeah they were paid to come onto the ship with us um, and they had specific most of the time they had specific um, experience within the countries that we were surveying. So they had been there previously, they had done this type of work before. So for both fish, they were either experts in fish or the benthic community. Um, we didn't really overlap. And so people stuck to those and um, we had training sessions for them to make sure that they knew their corals. <laughs> we interviewed people, a lot of them were grad students or former grad students um, that had master's students and things like that, that had experience with this. So um, we are very, you know, confident in all of the data that they were collecting. We validated it. We had our experts validating their work as well, um, just making sure that they were collecting the correct information and things like that. And then we also used photo transects to also kind of um, validate the findings to make sure that things weren't, you know, we weren't getting some people. So we did sort of like, cross analysis to make sure that none of the, um, if there was a person that maybe wasn't collecting consistent data or consistent with what we were finding from across the board, then we would go back and look and see why their data was looking different and whether it was, if it was invalid, then we would just totally toss it and not include it in our analysis. Um, but we don't, didn't really have to do that ever. So um, we were very confident in our, in our groups. And like I said, on the ship, we had training sessions before we even started for each of the people that came on board and 
Um, so they were well trained with our methodology. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, you said you, you work with many scientists, researchers from the countries and territories. Um, so like, in, I guess in some of them, you were also relying on their uh, knowledge of the rifts and how to survey in a, particular, in a specific manner. I, I don't know, but this is also part of the, of the voyage to rely on, on on the local or uh, yeah the, yeah so it was the, um so the we actually the survey methods we kept the same throughout all of the expeditions so that way we could compare um data across locations and so that was kept consistent but we were reliant on experts from each country um whether they were local or people that had been studying there for a long time um things like that and so we we worked closely with them and we always invited people on board that knew um, the area and frequently we had, uh, you know, marine managers and people that came on board to, and for the duration of the, our time in that country to help us choose sites specifically. It was really for choosing sites that were interesting and important to them so that they were, if they were interested in that for monitoring or like, for example, in Tonga, when we were in um, the Hapai group, they wanted us to go visit some of the sites that they had designated as this as an SMA. And so we went back to some of those to reassess those and um, were able to provide feedback in the reports about those different locations that we did survey both within and outside of them and things like that. So when I say we kind of like catered our work to them, it was because we were including them in our um, research. And so they did provide a lot of feedback though on, you know, things like economically important species, fish species that we maybe didn't know were, um, you know, specifically interesting or, you know, important for their communities. So it was always great and so helpful to have them. They were a critical part of our work. Yeah, um, uh, some of our colleagues from SPC, um, you don't join us uh, today, but I I'm sure uh, some of them will be really interested in, in the fish survey uh, and, and some of the findings you, you presented. So anyway, uh, for, for all of you, uh, the webinar, uh, the, the recording will be, the record will be shared uh, through the registration list and also through the YouTube channel. And, and yeah. So this will be shared online. Um, and, and we'll make sure as well to uh, to put some relevant information uh, about the about the webinar. Uh, I I see a comment from one of my colleagues. That's prep. Uh, yeah. Uh, for for this inf for information uh, to contribute greatly towards the state of environment and conservation report. Uh, <laughs> Especially the coral and coastal fish biomass indicators. Um, so that's yeah, that's a, that's what I, I was thinking as well um, to uh, incorporate this uh, this information and data into the state of environment and conservation report uh, here in the Pacific uh, and and for each countries as well uh, for the for these uh, specific items. So yeah, that would would be a, a great contribution uh, yeah. to add. Yeah. We'd be more than happy to work together. <laughs> and I just put the link uh, I've promised in the opening remarks, access okay. to Pacific Pro Refection Plan. Um, as I said, um, we are we are willing to um, yeah to release some uh, fact sheets on coral reefs for each uh, country and territory in the Pacific. Um, so we have a draft version and. And maybe we, we we would like to share these with uh, with some of the experts, uh, be, be the global or, or national experts, uh, to double check uh, you know the data information, uh, so that would be uh, also a great contribution to have uh, um, uh, these fact sheets available for each uh, expert member countries and territories. Uh, 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Maybe just one open question um, as we approach to, to an end. Um, do you have uh, already some first steps under your UN decade action? Uh, because as, as we are uh, all uh, building a, a plan over the next decade, um, this is something also to uh, not to um, uh, uh, to plan uh, step by step uh, over the decade. So do you have do you have uh, some first steps in mind and 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 you know how you yeah. Engage so I mean I, I think for our project the first step is really to um we're sort of I guess putting feelers out to see what communities are interested in working with us to bring our project to their country. Just like we did with Jiri, we never went anywhere we, where we weren't explicitly invited. Like we were approached to come. Um, and so we didn't, that's very important to us because we don't want to feel like we're pushing, you know, an agenda onto anybody. And so for us, it's, we want to make sure that we are invited. So if there are communities or countries or anybody that's interested in having us come, um, we're more than happy to talk to you more and share that. So what our first steps are to kind of see who we've worked with before, reach out to them and see who um, who is interested in working with us and to help get funding for it and things like that, because we are looking for funding for these projects. It's not cheap, as you guys know. So, um, but yeah, we do have a lot of the resources already available, but we are, but more of the on the ground work is gonna be going and working with the communities. And so, and like I said, it's the next step. So it's really figuring out who's interested in doing that and then getting there, getting the money to get there and to bring these programs to those communities. So that's kind of first step. And then um, in addition to that, just continuing our partnerships that we have going on um, to keep and to kind of like reignite um, the and and improve the the uh, the technology that we will be bringing to the community so to continue that as well so it's um multiple multiple things are happening we're working on sort of like individual aspects of the big picture <laughs> um ocean decade program by continuing some of our education programs and things like that and expanding them now um we also are sort of expanding some of our uh, Amy, who's our, I think she's on here, who's our education person, is starting to expand some of the curriculum to include things like seagrasses as well as mangroves. So I'm um, kind of expanding some of these programs to other near term tropical marine ecosystems. So we're not, you know, exclusive to just mangroves or just coral reefs, but also just the entire ecosystem as a whole, kind of the ridge to reef idea. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of projects going on, but like I said, we're always looking for new partners too. So that's something that we are always open to. And um, we, like I said before, we've always found that partnership is the best way um, to make progress happen. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're not a, we're not a mighty team, but we're a good team. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, some people are still entering uh, <laughs> in, in the webinar. Uh, so, Colleagues and participants, do you have any last question before we wrap up this session? I don't know. Yeah, no, just thank you guys so much for having it or, you know, for helping to host this. And um, if anybody has specific questions, reach out to me if anybody would like to if there's anybody from a specific country that would like us to host an individual one, we can also do that as well. If it's, you know, say um, somebody, I know people from the Cook Islands were here. So if the Cook Islands wants to be talked about it before, if somebody from the Cook Islands wants more information on the reefs, um, we're happy to do that as well. So, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, and yeah, so you have cheers from Cook Islands, Tahiti, <laughs> New Caledonia, so et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. And, and, so and great. We'll, we'll keep in touch for sure. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Rene, again, uh, the participants as well, and, and the interpreters uh, uh, during this session. Um, and uh, yeah, so 
we'll keep in touch. Uh, we'll share the, the record uh, of, the, of the presentation and some information uh, related to that. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much and, and, and see you soon. So have a good day or good night, uh, wherever <laughs> you are. Yeah, thanks you guys too. Thank you. All right, cheers.